Spartans, welcome to the Spartan Up podcast. I'm Joe DeSena, your CEO and founder, and we come at you nearly every day. We've got 300 people we've interviewed throughout the years. They are gritty, they're resilient, they have problems just like you and I, but they dug themselves out of their issues, they change their narrative, and they teach us how to be better, how to reach our peak potential. Anyway, stay tuned, you're gonna love this guest. This is a treat, this is Dan Crowley. We call him Uncle Dan because our producer, Marion, this is, this is her uncle, Uncle Dan. I got the pleasure of sitting down with Uncle Dan. He's 92 years old. I don't even wanna tell you what kind of vehicle he pulled up in. I met his wife, I don't even wanna, I don't wanna ruin it for you. Stay tuned, watch this. You think you're having a tough time at home right now in solitary confinement with popcorn and Netflix? Wait until you hear Dan's story. He takes it to level 100, and he'll make you realize that what we're going through right now is a joke. Stay tuned, pay attention. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Fresh Meal Plan. Deliciously prepared meals delivered right to your door. Visit freshmealplan.com spartan and use the code SPARTAN50 to save $50 on your first two weeks. Dan is a member of the greatest generation who found himself in a time and place where uncommon valor was a common virtue. Dan tells his remarkable story of service and survival without embellishment and with humility and humor. The memories he has from surviving the Bataan Death March are still vivid. Time has not dulled Dan's mind or the horrors he witnessed or the pain he felt. In a war that was marked by countless horrific acts of violence, the Bataan Death March stands alone as a particularly barbaric act. As many as 5,000 American soldiers and 18,000 Filipino soldiers were randomly executed, tortured, or starved to death during their 70-mile hike across Bataan. The march was later judged to be a war crime by Allied Military Commission. It's with great honor that Spartan Up! Podcast offers Dan Crowley an opportunity to tell his story, share his memories, and educate our audience to a historic event in the U.S. and world history. Spartan wishes to acknowledge that in this very special episode, there is some language used that would not be considered appropriate today. We have chosen to leave it unedited, however, because it does represent the specific time and place in which this story took place. We are with Dan Crowley, this wonderful 60-year-old gentleman. You look like you're 60. <laughs> I had to say, look at this I'll guy. I'll take it. Look at this guy. How old? 96, uh, 97 in May. 97, drives a convertible. But you've done, you've done um, whatever you've done has worked. And so most of the people out there that are listening and watching, they're trying to find out how to be better in life, how to be healthier, how to be fitter, how to um, be more resilient but also uh, how maybe to be motivated and not complain as much. Oh, I'm a big complainer. <laughs> you are breaking all the rules here with this yes. podcast, I have, I have a feeling. <laughs> so, so um, I the, can't for, stand uh, seeing obvious uh, stupidity. That's fair. <laughs> without calling someone's attention to it. Yeah, yeah, no, I want... Such I, as the restrooms as you enter Connecticut. So what amazes me is um, you are focused on fun, you're smiling, and we're focused on restrooms, but you were in World War II, and you were uh, connected to the, the, the Bataan Death March, and... Um, well, only that I escaped from it. Yeah. And so, um, I don't know, you've had a pretty rough part of your life, and it didn't seem to, it doesn't seem to have affected you very much. In what way? I mean, you're not negative. You're pretty positive. Oh, I'm quite negative. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about what happened. When did you go in? October 7th of 1940. October 7th. How old were you? 20... 18. Oh, 18. Yeah, I was out on a beer uh, in, uh, <laughs> imbibing spree, which we did every night. All right, so you were drinking. With two friends. You were drinking. And we decided, what the hell, let's get the hell out of this town, but we have no money. And we heard you could go in the military and go uh, wherever you wanted almost. So uh, we popped into a recruiting office in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And uh, They didn't take you in? 
they said, we haven't got any openings. It was a tough job getting in the military at that time because everyone wanted to get the benefits of a bed and clothing and food. Got it. Got That's it. Beca- how it was. Because, yeah. of, because of what was going on in the economy. Right. So you kept going from recruiting station to recruiting we station. We went from there to New Haven. <clears throat> and, uh, same thing. And they said you might be able to find uh, something available up in Hartford. So this is all in one day. We drove to Hartford, and he said, you guys are lucky. I've got three openings in the Philippines. We didn't know where the Philippines were. We never heard of it. (laughs) And so you took it. (laughs) We'll take it. And so then it was off to tropical Philippines for fun. Yeah, almost to uh, Hawaii. The cylinder head blew. Horrendous sound. Sounded like a torpedo hitting us. Frightening. (laughs) So we put in there for 10 days. In Hawaii. Until they could repair the engine in Hawaii. And they wouldn't allow us out of the uh, tent city next to Hickam Air Base. They were afraid you might leave. They were afraid we might go over the hill somewhere. (laughs) Sure. How many were on the boat? At that time, I don't know. if you had a guess, I mean, yeah, probably a couple of thousand. A couple of thousand. Knows. This is when they were finally deciding we better build the Philippines up and start throwing some warm bodies into it. Yeah, you know. this is before Pearl Harbor. Before Pearl Harbor. So now you you uh, leave Hawaii and you head over to the Philippines. And uh, but you had lots of um, advanced equipment with you, machine guns and stuff. Oh yeah, lots manufactured for World War One. So why did they do that? Why didn't they have? Um, they just didn't. We just didn't have enough equipment. They, the United States, we just didn't have enough stuff, or we screwed the up. People would not vote for Joe if he <laughs> went on the circuit saying that he was going to strengthen this country and build the military up. Got it. He wouldn't have been elected. They didn't want it because of World War One. People had had enough. Right. And they didn't want to waste any money on the military. Right. So we were uh, orphans as far as the government was concerned. <laughs> what, well, what did you spend your days doing? You were you were fixing planes, or what would you what what did you do each day? Frankly, we did very little. And we'd march from the tents. We were put up in tents on the edge of the airfield, and one of the uh, nasty features was Keep going. we were consumed with red ants, uh, infested with red ants. So uh, they would climb up your bunk and uh, do a good job of biting you. I, I I had my experience about three weeks ago with red ants. I was uh, with the Air Force uh, Special Warfare Unit, and I was in the woods, and we were doing an exercise, and I happened to sit down on a pile oh. of red ants. <laughs> I can't even imagine what you were going through. Uh, did you have a few bites? Oh, I, it was unbelievable how quick <laughs> uh, and and yeah. painful those little ants can be. Oh, yes. Yeah. So the answer was finally uh, tin cans with water for each leg of the bunk. The, yeah, no, that was smart. I, I yeah. was reading that. You'd put the uh, the legs of the bunks yeah. in. That's smart. So the ants couldn't get you. Right. It worked. <laughs> so, so then what happened? When did things change? Well, it was actually now, uh, stay with me on the dates. It was about, according to uh, rumor, I'm not positive, but it was approximately uh, 18 hours after Pearl Harbor was hit in the Hawaiian Islands, before it was our turn. It was approximately 18 hours. MacArthur, who was the Supreme Commander, had panicked, and they couldn't get a decision from him. We had 35 B-17s, which had flown in from Australia to reinforce the Philippines, and uh, he wouldn't allow them to take off. So the 
general in charge of the Air Force uh, in the Philippines at that time begged him to give him permission because he knew exactly where the Japanese bombers were based. Formosa was the main base, Taiwan now. And uh, he couldn't get permission. So when he finally got permission, the bombs were falling. On you. <laughs> On us. Yeah. Were you, were you bunkered in? Well, if you could call uh, this massive uh, fortification <laughs> massive, you were uh, in, in our area. We went out at night and dug holes, which are called foxholes in the infantry. Sure. Yeah. And uh, by day we'd stay in them if the if the air raids were going on. So so they were they were pounding uh, Nichols Airfield and all the surrounding areas to Manila, I guess. Well, the first raid on Nichols wiped out all the haggers and all the uh, machine shops and the fuel depots, all the repair facilities. So it was worthless from the first day. From then on, it was worthless as a base. Right. So then what? Then what do you do? <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> we sat there and took it until uh, roughly... Uh, when was it? Oh, the Christmas Eve. Uh, we got out of uh, Manila. Uh, we sailed across the bay to what is the Bataan Peninsula. Have you been near there ever? I, I've been to the Philippines, but never the Bataan P Peninsula. Well, so you sailed across. Yeah. And we were, it, it was in the dark, of course, because yeah. in daylight, you would have been straight to the bottom. Sure. So, uh, how many people made their way over? Well, a few thousand, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. All those bases around Manila which were worthless for combat, would uh, send all their personnel... Migrated over. Yeah. You know, and they were using... Uh, uh, Israel and boats. If you've seen the small Israel and... Uh, they were like a taxi service. Sure, sure. In the Philippines. So we were under the impression with... Uh, massive rumors that were spreading that we were going to be uh, traveling to Australia. So when dawn broke, we thought, my God, we're in Australia. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's how much we knew about uh, what was going on. Sure. Actually, we were on Bataan, the very tip. Sure. <laughs> and we unloaded, and I recall our company marching up the road. No one knew where the hell we were going. So uh, we finally found a place. At, the, we, at this point in time, yeah. I mean, is there like smoke everywhere, things on fire, or is it pretty no, calm? No, no, it's pretty calm. Quite calm from that standpoint, yeah. Because the destruction had been done. Had been done, yeah. And, and are you, are you feeling at risk at this point, or you're getting ready to take your cruise to Australia? Yeah. You're feeling okay? Scared to death, of Scared course. Scared to death. We yeah. didn't know what the hell the future held, yeah. but we knew we weren't ready. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But So you're marching up the road of the Bataan Peninsula. Yeah. And then we just came to a place where we unloaded everything that we had, and, and that's me. That's you? Yeah. Wow. This is a fellow from Oklahoma, I remember. You guys don't look scared. We're going You're, in there. you're smiling. <laughs> <laughs> we were probably singing. <laughs> so, so you're marching in Bataan. Yeah, all companies of people were given evidently a area to set up to be their personal headquarters, each Air Corps uh, unit. former unit, yeah. Sure. So we set up on the edge of the 
trail to the the jungle road. It was rather crude country. Yeah. And uh, and 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 then what? How long how long were you out there for? Oh, that went on until uh, till we uh, got involved in holding off the Japanese attempts to conquer the hide the lines areas so they could cut off the people who were fighting in the front. They were mostly Filipinos at this point. Filipinos defending Bataan. Bataan and, and helping you. Right. So if if they had conquered Bataan fast, they would have conquered the whole peninsula and the Philippines in a few days. So with our crude weapons and and ignorance <laughs> we didn't know how stupid we were, how bad our weapons were. Sure. We were probably under the impression who I can't remember that this is what you had. This is normal. Sure. World War One, O three Springfield rifles. Sure. Each shot you had to put the shell in, pull the bolt back, rev it forward, and you had five of those. Yeah. You didn't have brrr, brrr, yeah, as you see yeah. in the movies. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So uh, that was quite unbelievable accomplishment. They were very upset at being held up. The Japanese. Yeah. Uh, quite upset. <laughs> And especially the top commanding officer who was shamed by the Americans holding him up and holding up the entire effort to conquer the Philippines. He was supposed to do it in X number of days, and it didn't happen. So here's this handful of non-trained jackasses with well, ancient weapons holding up. His super trade, some of the best in the world. Why, why do you think you were able to hold them up? Well, we had the high ground. Right. And they were coming in on the water in barges. And you were actually firing down from the high ground yeah. into the sea. And you could see the barges coming. You could just pick them off. Oh, yeah. And the, I know the sound because the engines were manufactured in Greenwich, Connecticut. Palmer, one lug, they were called one luggers. They were a diesel one cylinder engine, and it was for fishermen. And the military converted them. So, so you'd hear this. Uh, the Japanese had the same thing. They stole our design. You'd hear the chug, chug, chug. And you knew they were coming, so you you truly had to wait till you saw the whites of their eyes, right. <laughs> and you just pick them off. And and uh, why didn't they send in their air power? Well, they did. They bombed uh, during daylight constantly, and they shelled long distance constantly. But you held them off. Yeah, if you have your head below the level of the ground, just a few inches, you can survive. Yeah. So here are shells bursting all around you, and uh, the foliage, the jungle, totally destroyed. You're in a position that's untenable. <laughs> But you're, but you're, but you're still smiling, <laughs> somehow. Well, the whole world smiles with you. Yeah, yeah. So we did that twice. Stop major landings. Twice over the course of how long? Well, from the uh, time we got to Bataan, which was Christmas Eve of '41, until. The surrender of a tab, which was April 9th of 42. It's a pretty long time to be holding them off. Yes, especially with 
almost non-existent food. Are you getting resupplies somehow? No, nothing. Nothing? No. Pardon me, the, uh, the submarines brought in a few anti-aircraft shells and a few other things like that, but we never saw it. It was coming into Corregidor Island, which is right off the shore of uh, Batad, about three miles. But it didn't make it to you? Well, no. And you could see Corregidor from Batan. Yeah. So now it's April. So now it's April. What happens? Well, the night of April 9th, the, uh, that night, they sent a, a radio message out to, uh, was received by all the various uh, companies dotted around Batan that uh, they would be surrendering because it was hopeless and he didn't want everybody massacred because the Japs had stated to him that if you don't surrender, we will simply massacre all of you. And Ed King was a humanitarian, basically. He was going to save as many of his men as possible. And if that could only be accomplished by surrendering what was left, there wasn't much to surrender. That was the way you did it. Now, you were ordered to march down to the tip of Bataan, singly or in groups, but to get to a road at the tip in a little town called Marvelous and line up and wait for the Japanese to take over. They were still shooting. They were still shelling, not as heavily. And anything that moved was strafed in daylight. So I got in the water. I decided personally I was not going to surrender. And so did a few other fellows. So we did, we ignored the order. How, how many lined up to surrender, if you had to guess? Oh, to surrender, I'd guess a few thousand. And how many jumped in the water with you? A few hundred. A few hundred. Uh, this is a guess. What was your plan? Get to Corregidor. We, uh, That's where the equipment and the food is. Oh, yeah, we heard the rumor. That's right. the impregnable fortress. Right. <laughs> that was all bull crap. <laughs> right. How long of a swim was it going to be? Well, they say three miles. I have no idea. I didn't have a measuring device. <laughs> <laughs> and you swam in the day or, or at night? At night. And I would uh, fortunately be able to hitchhike a ride with, with some lifeboats from a freighter that had been bombed and it was set afire. It was loaded with bombs. About 4,000 tons was, was the estimate. Wow. These were bombs that uh, could no longer be used in the Philippines because we had no means of delivering them. Who who, who who uh, who set them on fire? Was that the Japanese? Yeah. Uh, once, in other the words, rumor once was you... one small load Japanese plane dropped one bomb that <laughs> ignited this one ship, and uh -huh. it burned all day, and it was like a tidal wave. Were you you were in the water at this point? Yeah. How long? How when long? It blew. How long did it take you to make that that trek? God, I don't know. I mean, uh, a whole day or, or half a day or? Several hours anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when and I got there. You, you washed up on shore. Yeah. It was a rocky shore. And there was a fellow on guard. And he challenged us. And then he'd say, you're in the Marine Corps now. Because <laughs> they were Marines that were on that island. <laughs> Yeah, they'd been pulled out from Shanghai, and they were called the China Marines, if you've ever heard of them. No. They're the fourth regiment of the independent regiment of the Marine Corps. So so uh, is it a welcome sight? You're happy to see this Marine? Well, yes, no matter what he was. Right. <laughs> and you're thinking you're safe now. 
We're safe again. <laughs> safe again. And in the distance, the, the ship is burning. Yeah, yeah. It, it, well, it wasn't too far because you could clearly see the outline and the, the smoke pouring out of it. So now what? You go. We you had you no go, idea of the reproductions. You check into a hotel at this point? Oh, or? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Grab a meal, a shower, shave? We were assigned to various marine companies. Okay. And I had the honor of being in Shifty Schaffner's company. Check him out. Shifty Schaffner. Shifty Schaffner. 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 He was immortal. He went from first lieutenant to general. He had been a all-American football star. How, how long until they took that island? Oh, that was May 6th. So, Surrendered again by the uh, commanding general, Wainwright. Now what? You're, ordered you're, to surrender again. You're going to escape again? You're going to swim to Australia? There was no place to swim to. <laughs> <laughs> so the... Uh, well, let's take a break. Yeah. You and I will do some push-ups and drink some water. Yeah. And then I want to hear what happens next. Great. I'll do a thousand. How many are you going to do? I'll do a hundred. You do a thousand. <laughs> Today's episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Fresh Meal Plan. Deliciously prepared meals delivered right to your door. Fresh Meal Plan has six different plans to choose from. They offer traditional, paleo, keto, vegan, lean and mean, and a la carte selections. No matter what you choose you'll be confident that there are no artificial preservatives, no added sodium, and no artificial ingredients. I had no idea that you could beat me in push-ups. That was pretty damn good. I'll apologize for my <laughs> lack of training, but... Uh, <laughs> you crushed me. I think you could handle it if you tried hard. I gotta try harder. Yeah. Um, so, you're now surrendered. You've got no uh, hope in sight, right? You're nervous. Scared. Rather. Scared. Yep. No a name for that. No escape plan. No escape plan. <laughs> so what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to endure. Our first test of endurance was after the surrender of Corregidor. We were packed into approximately three acres of uh, area which had been the supply depot for the trucking transportation on Corregidor. So, so you're, how many of you are on this three-acre plot? Too damn many. Too damn many. So the, the urges that are normal... Uh, were uncontrollable because of the rotten diet, so it was defecation and urination everywhere, everywhere, and uh, believe me, it was uh, no way of getting away from it. So the stench was horrendous. It was so bad you didn't smell it. Wow! And we had to dig. Finally, we dug tremendous holes, and. Uh, People actually squatted down to use them and slipped backwards over the muddy lip into the mess wow. and drowned in it. Wow. So you can think of any more pleasant death than that. Uh, and you're still smiling. Yeah. So so you're you're trapped in this three acre um, cesspool. Yeah. That's what it was. A cesspool. And um, Food's pretty good. <laughs> what are you guys eating? If you had something that you brought in from somewhere or somehow in your pockets or if you had a little bag, that's what you ate. Uh, there was no real ration of food. They gave us finally a little grain which was uh, cooked with water, so it was a liquid rice, about a 30 or mess kit of liquid rice. They had no responsibility to let you live. It didn't, oh, no. didn't really matter. You had to become valuable enough to be given the right to live. How would you become valuable? Well, if they needed 
labor for specifics, slave labor uh, operation that was needing manpower, that you were allowed to live to do that. Because, because, because otherwise you're an expense. Totally. And, and your captors at this point, do they, do they just look through you? Like when you talk, are they, is it not a human connection? It's not human at all. Their attitude towards you is you are an insignificant insect. Yeah. And so what's going through your head at this point? Survival. Don't get in his line of sight if possible. Squat down behind the tallest guy. <laughs> yeah, and just survive. Yeah. My immediate group were uh, sent back to the large uh, reserve camp who were allowed to live, the way you put it, called Kabata Tuwad. From there, the Americans were sent out on slave labor work details. Well, it wasn't a very pleasant place to be as far as food and uh, sanitation. Sure. But uh, there was always something worse or something better. So you hear a rumor, and I heard a rumor that there was a sign on the a bullet board they put up that... They needed so many men for work at this uh, tropical paradise. Shangri-La. Palawan. Yeah. Palawan? Palawan. Yeah. So they wanted semi-skilled Americans. So you signed up. So I signed up. What the hell? Yeah. This is a known filthy pest hole. That may be better. Right. We went down an open boat. It was a... Not, not a bad ride. Some fresh air? Yeah, fresh. How long had you been in the cesspool at that point? <laughs> How long was it? God. It wasn't too long. A couple of months? A couple of months. Couple of months. Yes, yeah. Okay, so now yeah. you're on this fresh air open water ride. Right. And we get to Palawan, yep. and we're now found, we find out what we're going to do there. There were several hundred of us. We are going to build an airfield without any mechanized equipment. <laughs> For the Japanese. If you can picture that. Yeah. Totally ignorant about how do you go about building an airfield. Even the Japs were totally ignorant about what, how we were going to do this. But they knew one thing. They were going to keep you moving with clubs. And we called the clubs vitamin sticks. I like that. Yeah. I got to get some of those for the office. If you have no food, All right. but you have a club to urge you on to work, yeah. get Vi them from the office. A vitamin sticks. Vitamin stick. sticks. <laughs> shovels. Picks and shovels, axes and saws, yeah. and muscle. You were 18 months on Palawan. <laughs> She's got it. Yeah. A year and a half. You're saying a month now. Oh, 18 months. Oh, 18, months. Yeah. Eight, 18 months building that airfield. Air yeah. Well, I didn't build it single handed. Oh. No, no, you and the team. <laughs> you and the team and the body mistakes. The team, yeah. Uh -huh. It was uh, semi jungled. And it was also a fruit plantation bananas and coconuts. Yeah. So, so you, had, uh, you had good food to eat. But if you touched it, you were beaten to death. With a vitamin stick. Yeah, if that's what ha happened to be handy. So, did, you, did you see any guys get clubbed to death? Well, not all the way, but I was almost beaten to the point of death. I was, instead of a vitamin stick, I was uh, pick handled. Ah. Uh, that was a little heavier. It's a bonus. Yeah. I was lying on the ground, I'll never forget it, and this son of a bitch swung for my head again. And he was stopped by another Jap. We need him to work. So he talked the other guy not to swing. You got lucky. I wouldn't be here. You got lucky. He would have crushed my skull in. Huh. You know what a pick handle is like. I know very well what about a pick handle is. Yeah, 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 yeah. So 
from there. Yeah. 18 months, you survive. Survive that 18 months. Then you sign then, up. For... Uh, you don't know how I got back to Manila. This was interesting. Yeah, let's hear it. Uh, some of the men who couldn't do it anymore, it just was too much for anyone. Found a guy from Long Island, I'll never forget. Jerry, we called him Jerry the Executioner. Right. And Jerry had found a stump down in the rear of where we slept. There had been a barracks for the Filipino Constabulary. They were like the National Guard. And a steep staircase went down. And at the top, there was a 50-gallon drum always brewing tea. The Japs were a big believer. If you drank enough tea, you could ward off anything, and it would fill your stomach in lieu of food. So you could go out on this rear deck of the uh, wooden barracks and get yourself a cup of tea, if you were lucky enough to have something to put it in, and then down these steep wooden stairs. They were just boards, of course, down the cross. And uh, when you got down there, if you've made arrangements with Jerry, you'd put your arm on the stump, and he had found a metal bar lying behind there some from some previous construction, I guess. So he would bring this metal bar down on your arm and crush it for 10 cigarettes. That was the going rate. This was to get out of work. Got it. So yeah. if you wanted, you could have your arm broken by oh, Jerry. Yeah. That, yep. and that, but you'd get a cup of tea as part of and the we deal. We would tell the Japs that we fell in the Benjo. That was the concrete floored uh, sanitary facility ah. that the Filipino guard had. So that was the semblance of civilization. Did they, did, they, did they start to notice that there were a lot of guys coming up with the same injury? Yes, and uh, I'm glad you asked that. The commanding officer, Japanese, at that time was, uh, what the hell was his name? Anyway, well, I'll think about it. He lined us up one morning. We had to line up every morning, and he'd make his speech telling you how you must work hard, you'll go home to your family, wherever you live, in the California, and so on, and uh, you have a happy time and a happy life, and you must work hard to, so you can support your family and save your money. They'd give us pieces of paper that said 50 centavos, a Japanese occupation centavos, not regular Sure. Filipino said Davos. <laughs> so he would line us up and he'd say, You must stop falling in Benjo. Because <laughs> we would say, We fell in the Benjo. The, right. the... <laughs> he, he spoke English or he had somebody translate? No, he spoke that enough English. Not yeah. enough English. You must stop falling in Benjo. He, in other words, he was trying to make you understand that they desperately needed your labor, right. and they didn't want to lose it. They didn't give a damn with <laughs> So how many, how many um, did you, you had your arm broken by Jerry? Not me. You didn't do it? No, no. I heard about how these other fellows were doing it right. to get out of work. Yeah. And the American doctor who saved my life... Uh, what the devil was his name? Kelly? Dr. Mango. Mango. She's got all the yeah, facts. Dr. Mango. Dr. Mango. I got in the line and and told Dr. Mango uh, my sorry tale of how, how I just couldn't handle it anymore. I was gone. And I put on the good act with the hair over the shoulders and the beard down here, up to my waist almost. And a wild look at my eye. <laughs> and he finally stamped me unfit for labor. 
Right. So I got out of any more of that. Right. Because after I left on a small boat with a bunch of the fellows who had their arms broken, shattered, I should say. Very so clear. now you're back in Manila. Back in Manila, and then back up in come out of Taiwan for reassignment to Japan. So you're 17 days, you're yeah. on this hell ship. Yeah. You get to Japan, and you're thinking sushi and geisha girls. Oh, yes. Yeah. Now, yeah. What, what are you thinking? They're going to kill you in Japan? What's going through no, your mind? No, you were just yeah. going to work your bottom off, that's all. Every morning, I had to get in a metal bucket with about 25 other fellas with a rusted spring on top and a rusted cable attached to that. And, the, you know, the springs were massive, about this big. And uh, the chap who ran... I hope no one is offended by my use of... No, 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 it's fine. Chap, the, the, <laughs> the, the chap who handled the winch that the cable wound up on was having a wonderful time every morning at our expense. He would let the cable, loose. cable go free fall about 1,900 feet. And then he would hit the brake on the winch. Scare and the, the, scare and the, the cable would tighten up. And it was over your head. You were waiting for that thing to snap because you were positive it was going to sap one of these 40. So how long did this go on for? This went on until the surrender of Japan. Every morning, I went down in that bucket oh. with the rusted spring and the rusted cable. Near Tokyo or north or? Northwest into the mountains. Okay. Ashio, near Nogano. Oh, okay. Yeah, where yeah. the Olympics were. Yeah, I know where it is. The Gabo. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was, I'd say, the spring of 44 until September of 45. Okay. 18 months. 18 Yeah, roughly. Yeah. So this has been one big fun vacation since oh, you yes. checked in in Connecticut. Yes. <laughs> I bet, I bet you're re at this point you're rethinking why the hell you guys went from from recruitment center to recruitment center when they told you to, they had no room. You were rethinking that decision. Uh, yeah. Uh, one thing had a massive impact. That was going out of New York Harbor. We sailed off from Brooklyn. Yep. Brooklyn Army Base. That's where the General Grant sailed from. And... Uh, when you went by the Statue of Liberty, you said to yourself, oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. What was the lowest point? The point where you just couldn't take it anymore? Oh, that would have been on... Uh, would it be Palawan? Yeah, I'd guess Palawan. Building the base, building, trying to build the airstrip? Yeah. I had the good fortune to be assigned to some delightful details. One was unloading powdered cement from a ship with another guy, and these bags probably weighed about 90 pounds. I don't know what they weigh, but he would get on one end, I'd get on the other, and we're in the hold of the cement ship throwing them in this big net, if you've ever seen I've that. I've done the work. I know exactly you what You know what it is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, we're inhaling yeah. the cement yeah. dust, yeah. and we're covered with it. The perspiration is turned into a... You turn it into a piece of cement. Exactly. Yeah, inside and out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it dehydrates you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. So that was probably uh, one of the worst. And Palawan in general, the brutal slavery on the airfield. The vitamin sticks. The vitamin sticks were just part of it. But uh, it's a good memory point to remember. Yeah. <laughs> vitamin sticks. What did you do when you got home? What did I do? When you got home. Uh, we had... At that time, a thing called the readjustment.
payment of $20 a week for a year. 5220 Club, it was called. Did you ever hear of it? No. Yeah, that was for the men when they got home. For 52 weeks, you got $20 a week. So we were on one continuous beer drinking uh, <laughs> yeah. soiree. Yeah. And uh, until it ran out. What was your first job? My first yeah. job. After returning. I applied for uh, regular channels, big corporations. Yeah. No one would uh, hire, you. hire you at all. You were marked actually as a, not fit for labor or for anything that required mental capacity for that company. Such a big company, such as ATT and sure, so on, sure. mobile, and uh, so what'd you do? What did I do? I did what you had to do. You went out and sold products on commission that no one wanted. What'd you sell? Because they couldn't say you can't have the job because they weren't paying a penny. Sure. What'd you uh, sell? At that time, it was all sorts of cheap trinkets, more or less, covered yeah. by the overall uh, term jewelry. Yeah. And uh, my brother helped get it for me. He told me at the low point when all I was getting was no, 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 for a normal, uh, from normal companies that, that you'd think about trying to get a job with. Yeah. He say, don't tell them you were a Japanese prisoner. That's the worst thing you could do. We were marked uh, lousy. Sure. Yeah. Tortured and beaten and not, not right in the mind. Oh, we were that. definitely uh, unfit for... Do you, do, do you think that was true, or, or did you uh, assimilate pretty well when you got back? Was your head all screwed up or no? Yeah. Yeah. Because you seem pretty good now. Oh, well, I healed. What would you say to, um, you know, there's 22 uh, soldiers a day that are, uh, you know, committing suicide? It's a terrible tragedy, and it's needless. It shouldn't be. I don't think they're being worked hard enough, number one. You, mean, not, you mean physical labor? If they had more physical right, labor, they might... That would help a lot. Yep. But, but they're not being checked properly. Because uh, this age we live in has so many distractions which are not healthy. Yep. So, um, yeah. I don't know. I'm honored to, to have uh, been sitting next to you for, uh, it's got to be an hour. And um, Well, I'd love to have had you with me. As a... I would have loved to have been with you. <laughs> I'm probably a little demented that way, I, but I... <laughs> There was nothing you said that sounded um, like I wouldn't have enjoyed it. Oh, you would have enjoyed it. I would have enjoyed it. I oh, like yeah. work. I like work. I, yeah. I would have done the vitamin sticks I wouldn't have minded. The cement I wouldn't have minded. The, the, the uh, defecation. The sanitation you would have minded. Yeah, that would have been a problem. Yeah. The lack of food, that's just... Yeah. yeah. Knowing that you came out of it alive is obviously easier. The un, you, you didn't know. What, how this was going to end. That's right. And so you always kept a positive outlook? I would say relatively. Compared to your peers? Yeah. I knew I was going to live, and I knew I was going to make the bastards pay someday. Did you get even? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> You're awesome. This guy's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. You know, it's not every day that we get an opportunity like that. Like, we go, we find all these incredible people. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a guy who is, he's an outlier in terms of the kind of people we get to talk to. His this experience is like a whole is, other level. His experience is more extreme. He's from, you know, a couple of generations ago, really. And um, one thing that really jumped out at me, and I don't know if it was a generational thing or from his military experience, 
he rarely ever used the word I. Every time you ask him about experience, he goes, well, we mm. went across whenever. And, you know, we were in the crash. And I found that really interesting. You know, we talk about the, the me generation, the I generation, the iPod and the I everything. He was very, very much a we guy. That's so interesting. I, I didn't even observe that at the time. What was it like? Because you were in the room. So what was, I mean, what was the energy? What was, what was it like? I'll be honest. I mean, I think that the, the idea that, that you guys talked about in the open, that you almost didn't get the sense of the depth of that experience because of mm-hmm. the way he told the story. Yeah. And I think we've, we've talked about that. We've found that with a lot of, mm-hmm. a lot of our guests. Sometimes the people that do the more amazing things they aren't always the people that tell the story in a dramatic way. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't know if there's, that's related. Well, I also wonder if not telling in a dramatic way is also a defense mechanism. Yeah. Uh, sure. If you stop and think and really kind of, you know, peel the onion back and dig down whatever your metaphor there is, uh, you know, does it become harder? And, and my answer would be yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't know Joe. And 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 right. I think it's so some maybe. pretty intense personal stuff. I think, like you said, if you if you start to really go into how that felt and what that experience was, mm-hmm. it's it, it, you're being very vulnerable. Yeah. Which you and, know, and I, and I think he also knows, as many veterans do, he can tell the story, but many people can't relate to it anyway. Sure. Right. Yeah. So for them to really understand it, again, you'd have to go at a much deeper level, and it's it's you know, is is it worth it basically? What it's going to do to him to tell that story. So so maybe we can talk about um you know what we did get from it. What what kind of the impact it had or the lessons learned from that. Well, one big thing for me and he talked about like the the crash in 29 and Joe said what was that like for you he said it was normal because everyone was experiencing Everybody. it. Right. And I and I think that um that the experiences he went through while deeply personal um, he experienced them communally, and so you know, I'm um, like when he well, when it, your we your we sure comment. yes, right. and just just when he was overseas, he wouldn't say, you know, I spent all those years in a prison camp. He'd say, boy, the boys and I, we, you know, and and even the things that were specific to him, I I just feel that there's a lot of strength in that, that that he drew from, and I don't mean that he's he's using it in any kind of artificial way. I mean that at the time. There was that collective, and mm-hmm. and it just yeah I don't want to belabor that, but just I, I really felt that um that's probably part of what drove him forward and allowed him to keep going because also th- what he was doing wasn't selfish either right mm-hmm. you know well you use the word when we when we introduced the podcast you use the word to describe him delightful yeah, um, sure. and when I was watching it I found him to be magical like yeah. his spirit was so alive and um and vibrant. And yep. to me, I think that's just so profound that somebody can go through something that he went through and keep that spirit intact. And I'm guessing along the way that there were fractures. I mean, we're human. How could there not be? But he's he's brought it he's brought himself back together and probably again through the help of community and through the help of, you know, the people he was with. And and I suspect that that, that spirit, that optimism, whatever that is is why he survived. And I think about, like, there's a a great biography of Shackleton. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest principles they talk about is this, uh, almost to a fault sometimes, he was so optimistic. right? And yet that ability, (laughs) or or like J.R. Martinez, right? And he talked about he's watching his hands burning in front of him and wanting to close his eyes, but he kept knowing that if he could just stay alive until someone rescued him, but that confidence that he had. So it's that optimism that allowed him to survive right. in a way, yeah. and, I, and I suspect that that might have been the case in, in Dan Crowley's uh, w- case. One thing that Dan said, though, and Tim and I were laughing about this uh, off camera and preparing for this, um, you know, we want to focus on the positive and the, and the this and that and everything else, but there's also that I knew I was going to survive yeah. and make them and, pay. And make them pay. Yeah. Yeah. Pay the, back, the, right. the great pay thing back. is when Joe said, did you make them pay? No, not yeah. really. Not, not, not really. Not <laughs> yet. Yeah, it's not, not yet. yet. Yeah, yeah, right. still, still yeah, yeah. The calendar yeah. still ticking along. That's on right. The clock still ticking. Yeah, I love that moment. And, and, and you know, it's funny. Um, we, we've talked a little bit about, I mean, how, how old he's 90, 96. 96. Yeah, that's that's amazing. At 96 years old, to, to have the just the depth and the breadth of experience to draw on and to find the joy in it, right? Yeah. I, I read a great thing a while ago. I may have mentioned this once before on the podcast, but it was the idea that um, – uh, if you can't find joy in snow, you'll just have less joy, but there's still going to be as much snow, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And so whatever's going on in your life, if you can't enjoy it, it's still there. And, you know, I'm sure, Tim, again, you know, having been there, well, you've actually physically been there, haven't you? Uh, I have been to Bataan, yeah, 91 or so. And that's, it's it's great you ask that because I think what's missing from the interview a little bit, or not really missing, it's there, but again, for 
for maybe maybe younger listeners, younger than me, and, and I again had an opportunity to go there, is again just the horror of what took place there. Mm-hmm. So you're talking about rounding up soldiers who have surrendered, and there's supposed to be a code to that, and how you treat people. At least the United States does. And they were marched along, and and uh, the Japanese captors would, to make a point, would just come up and bayonet people randomly, so that the guy behind would know that you know it could have been him. And they'd just leave the body, or they would drive over the body, or they'd behead people, or they'd just take them out and torture them. And we're not talking about one guy randomly or some. Sometimes a hundreds at a time, mm. you know. I mean, so he witnessed all of that. Yeah. And so when we're talking about a vitamin stick. Meaning, meaning a motivational stick hit me yeah. so that I can get a little bit more energy to start moving. You're talking about really a rifle and a bayonet, and you get lucky if you got hit with the rifle and not the bayonet. Mm. Yeah. So it, it, it's it's important not to kind of gloss over that again. And and he talked. I don't know if it if it made it in the interview, but I know it's in in an oral history that he's given where um, their first task when they became prisoners of war was burning the bodies that they had killed. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, and there were thousands of them we need to hear the stories from the people who've been there and seen it before you know the idea that we can sit down with a world war ii veteran and talk about something that you know most of us can't relate to because we weren't there or you know even my my parents weren't there so the fact that there's somebody who can still tell those stories we need we need to hear those stories we need we need to remember where we came from and um and what what we can hopefully avoid doing too many more times in the future well and i think too it's not just about hearing the story but it's about opening your opening up and becoming available to the wisdom that you can gain from the story even if it's not you know, well, you know, I'm I'm going to enlist and then I'm going to go to war. So, I, but like as human beings, how do we learn from this individual who went through something that was extraordinary and came out on the other side? What, how do we what are available? some of the things that you think you, that you could pull from that in your context? Because I'd be interested to hear that. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think the the mental toughness part is huge. I mean, you you know, you said earlier and we talked about that. Like he always knew he was going to survive, right? So I think like that that. That persistence of hope, I think, is so key for all of us when we encounter something that's difficult and encounter a struggle. Um, that, to me, landed really hard. Yeah. What about others? I just, I really like when you watch, it's more on how he lives and what he says, but the idea of this happened, it did happen. And now I've got to go live my life. And he joked about, you know, there was some wine involved and some beer involved in the recovery, <laughs> but that there's still joy to be had. Right. And so he's not sitting there rehashing this terrible thing that happened and making himself a victim of that story forever. It's certainly part of his history, but, you know, he's still finding so much joy in life. So to me, that that was the big thing was whatever's happened to you, it's happened. And now you have to go and have a great life. Yeah. How about you? How about you I would just say the same thing from a lot of these stories, but. Again, for him, even probably more so, belief in yourself, right? Belief yep. in self. But belief in self is derived from somewhere, right? So you have to have a foundation. So whether that foundation is your family, your community, faith, all of the above, you have to have it without, mm. the, without that foundation, without those roots. We're separate to talk about the ecosystem, <laughs> you know, but, but it's, it's very important. So you can believe in yourself because you've, you've seen others as well, and you can draw strength upon that. Yeah, and and for me, it's that it's that role model that he can be in terms of being that kind of a person, a person that can interact with others in a joyful way, which I would love to do better, right? And and to to take those hits and to continue to receive those hits, and yet, you know, I don't want to say be unaffected, but to not let it affect the way you interact with the rest of the world with the people around you yeah. or to let it let it impact you but in a way that guides it in a better way you That's, know yeah. Yeah, so not not blocking up the possibility that we're going to be impacted because we're humans but that we we work through it to guide us to be better yeah so it better said <laughs> <laughs> was i right uncle dan is unbelievable right think about what he went through the baton death march swims trying to get away, gets caught, gets put in a prisoner of war camp. His, his comrades are breaking their arms. They're having one of, one of their friends break their arms in the back so they can get out of work. Barely able to survive, barely able to sustain themselves. And this guy's got a smile from ear to ear. This guy is squeezing all the juice out of life. And I think it's a wake-up call for all of us, any of us that are sitting around, sorry, feeling sorry for ourselves, feeling sorry for ourselves about solitary confinement. We're stuck in our houses. Oh, poor me with Netflix and popcorn, and it's so hard. 
I challenge you, I challenge myself. Let's try to do five days. Let's try to do five hours of what Dan went through. Try to do five burpees, all right? So, so here we are, we're down on ourselves, we're complaining to everybody, we're nervous, we're scared. Dan gives us hope. Dan shows us what the human being is capable of when they're positive, when they're optimistic, right? When they're getting after it. And so I think we take some serious lessons home from Dan. Make sure you check us out on Instagram, at Spartan Up Podcast. Make sure you leave some notes. I want to know, I want to know this week how you took the Dan Crowley, Uncle Dan's podcast, and applied it to your life. What did you do that was hard? Did you take a cold shower? Did you help somebody? What did you do different after this podcast? I want to hear from you. And check me out, at Real Joe DeSena on Instagram, and I'll give you a little kick in the butt and try to get you motivated. And who knows, maybe you, maybe you can get this close to to being like Dan. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Fresh Meal Plan. Deliciously prepared meals delivered right to your door. Visit freshmealplan.com slash Spartan and use the code SPARTAN50 to save $50 on your first two weeks.